Hi, everybody. Recruiting Animal here on March 29th, 2023. Last week, I did three <coughs> starts to the show. This time, only two. This is the second one. The guest is the Brad, T. Brad Kalensky. Hi, Brad. He's back after many, many years. And the salesrecruiter.com, Michael G. Cox. Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, anything anybody has to say before I, I get going? The Brad? No, let's shoot. Okay, you got a, he's got a good voice. I like it. Nice, uh, deep, uh, not a real baritone, but it's got some resonance. You're in I love, think that's man. important for a recruiter. The Do voice, you, uh, Brad? The you think face. that's important? I can see little hearts just like fluttering around. Yeah, no, no. I've always admired uh, Don't cut Josh, any slack. Akers. Josh Akers had the best voice. And when Maureen was on regularly, she said it was the sexiest voice as well. Okay. No, no, she liked, uh, what was that dude's name? Um, uh, he, he worked on Jerry's. Travis, team. Travis, Travis. Okay. Yeah, but he came after. OK, what okay. about this? Uh, what about this for a starter? You call. I got this from LinkedIn. OK, you call a, a, a candidate, cold call him. And uh, he says, I don't I don't want to speak to recruiters. You say, I'll send you a Starbucks card if you give me two minutes. And he says, OK, two minutes. What do you think about that, Brad? I would never do that. Why not? Number one, it's it's too much admin headache to to send out uh, the, the cards. Number two, if they don't want to talk, is it? You can send out credits online just like that. It takes a minute. No, it's not. It's not worth the time. It's what not. if it's someone you really think is good and you really want to talk to, and you figure this is a, an approach that nobody else is going to use? Yeah, well, there, there's 500 of those people. If you're targeting a certain no, industry, there I, no, there ain't. That's okay. not true. Why do you say there's 500? Uh, you work in a field that there's 500 of every good candidate. That all of all the companies we work with are looking for the same kind of people. So in this case, we deal in the in the tech space. So these are a lot of full stack, you know, software engineers, DevOps folks. They're all looking for the same type of person, and it's just industry specific or sector uh, specific. And then we're just targeting companies to find those people. The good news is that all these companies have these people. It's just finding which ones meet the standards that we have set and then meet okay, the client. I'm going to give you some advice. Loosen it up a little. I already complimented you, and Michael G. Cox made fun of me for it. Loosen it up, okay? Michael G. Cox, would you do that? Uh, no, no, not for a two-minute uh, meeting, no. Well, two minutes is all you need to present a job. No, but you've already declared that your time is worthless, and therefore you must buy somebody else's time. It's a trend. gimmick, okay? Uh, Rich Rosen says, uh, well, we'll see what he says. I think he'll agree with you. But Rich Rosen says... The natural response of people is to say no. They are protecting themselves. The first thing they do all the time is say no. So if you use this, if it's a $5 card, uh, it's just a way to breach that, to, to do a pattern interrupt. Nobody's with me on this. No, no. To, to my, Michael G. Cox makes, makes the perfect point. The time is too valuable to, to try to force someone to speak to you. If they want to speak with you, you move on, on to the next. Okay. I, I've, were, I've seen it. I've seen it done before, and it's it's... In other situations, it, it seems I've never done it. It seems like it would be tempting. Like if you were trying to get a meeting with the head of uh, sales for a major organization that you're targeting as a client and you can handle all that work, maybe you say, look, let, you know, maybe in exchange for a $500 donation to your charity of choice, let's have a one hour conversation or something like that one hour wow i'm not gonna wow. do it for two minutes yeah no i mean like like doing like a charity golf outing or going to a fundraiser you know where that person's at that's more the ticket than you know just kind of putting yourself out there for for two minutes i mean that's i get gift cards all the time for 100 dollars amazon this i don't even entertain it it's not worth who my give, time who sends you gift cards Salespeople trying to sell me something Give us an example, if you can. Kind of, if you try to, trying to sell me some kind of recruiting tool, or or you know, finding contact information, or or uh, you know, just to get me on the phone, just because I own the company, so they're constantly trying to see if they could do business with with my company, and and I don't even entertain those. Honestly, they could give me five thousand dollars, I wouldn't entertain it. Yeah. Wow, He's it's just not worth it's just, it's just not worth the time. Okay, big shot. Now we're going to go into your background a bit. Okay. You were uh, an IT support person and a sysadmin person. Am I right? That's correct. And yes, then I... you decided 12 years ago to go into recruiting. Am I right? I've been in recruiting longer than that. Started my company 12 years ago. And then before that, I was uh, in recruitment for five years. In corporate, in-house? In no, uh, agency, all agency. 
So I got oh, recruited okay. out. So I was in tech and then a recruiting company that was placing me somewhere asked if I wanted to join them as a, as a recruiter. And I said, I have no, I know nothing about recruiting. And it just so happened that one of the people that worked there knew my last name, knew my dad, they grew up together and said, yeah, let's bring him aboard here. And he was basically my mentor, told me what to do, stayed there for four years. And then I moved to, uh, to another uh, recruiting company. Okay. Well, why, why did he think it was your dad, something special? He said, well, this guy's uh, son is going to be a superstar. Okay. Yeah. Is that what happened? No, that my, they, they were just like, uh, you know, growing up the neighborhood type buddies, like causing mayhem. Uh, you know, it, it was back in the day, like, like from, from that perspective, there was no, but you, you okay. give no, certain, it, it may be wrong or right, but you, you give certain uh, weight to an individual based on knowing his parents. <laughs> Food industry recruiter, Ernie Marino.com. Okay. Hello, guys. Uh, okay. Ernie. Okay. Uh, the Brad. Okay. I, I'm in the middle of investigating this guy's background. So you had that sysadmin. You weren't a developer or anything like that, but you had a technical background and you started recruiting technical people. What kind of technical people? Well, we started out doing like desktop support, A plus techs. Like th these are your, you know, 18 dollar an hour type people. Uh, you know, if they're living, breathing, have a car, have an A plus tech, we, we would place them on, on a contract. Um, these are like your Unisys, CompuCom, you know, going to the airport, just doing that like refresh type stuff. Then I moved up mainly through IT infrastructure type type of roles and then project management and then got into ultimately developers and, and more. OK, senior. so at those first stages, those were the kind of guys your background came came from that. Exactly. That's important. OK, yeah. so so did you have uh, did your background give you incredible uh, credibility with these people and, and the clients because you you knew what they did and you talked the talk? Yeah, I mean, it was it was easy for me to understand. I almost got fired in the first three months because I didn't place somebody. But because uh, I thought I knew it all I, already, I thought this is easy because I already know these people. I know what they're doing. And then uh, my boss, who was the partner of the firm, said, listen, you got to make a placement in the first three months or, or you're out of here. Yeah, so really, I didn't realize. And I had a senior recruiter that I was that I was working with, that I was paired with sitting next to him in a cubicle. And he showed me, listen, this is how it's done, because I was just sending emails and hoping for the best. He's like, that's not how it works. So I started doing cold calling. And this was back in the time when you know we were doing in-person meetings and events and things of that nature. So. That's how it, that's how it kicked off. Okay, so is, uh, anybody else can get in on this, but were you not making placements because you weren't cold calling, because you were uh, stuck in the email? Is that it? And why did they let you, if that was so simple to solve, why did they let you go for three months without giving you advice after two weeks? So, so no, the, the advice was there, but again, I was dealing with a senior recruiter that wanted to make a boatload of money and he wasn't incentivized to help me do anything. So I was basically, uh, you know, trying to figure out on the, on the job training while he was, you know, doing his thing. So I would sit next to him and just listen, you know, him bagging the phones and, and him going through a, 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 a site or a platform or software that we use called WinSearch, which you could click a button and it could go out to, you know, thousands of people. That's what I was doing. But what I didn't realize was the people that I was presenting weren't as, as good as uh, what they needed to be. So I didn't really have standards set. I was following. Why not? You were in the field. Does anybody else want to ask him? I'm I'm really yeah, curious did why it. he didn't succeed after yeah. day but one. It, it sounds like he was missing the sales portion of this. Exactly. It, it sounds like he was just trying to inform people via email about a job rather than actually picking up the phone. Well, you, that's you, one problem. But he also you, said he didn't have the ability to judge the candidates. That's what I thought would be his strength. Brad, Brad how are you? How, how are you being compensated? Yeah, so I, I uh, at the time, I, I think I got a base salary of thirty-eight grand, and I was being compensated uh, on commission as well. That's that's why, right there. <laughs> Shit, money was coming in. Yeah, man. Cash pay the bills. <laughs> that that you base. Know, when I don't think that was the reason. No. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. When you, have, when you have to book. Well, when you get when you get when you get no money coming in, you start saying, "What the hell am I doing wrong?" But I don't no. think so. I don't, I don't think so. No, I agree with hey, hey. all this. Brad's Why do right you there. have that lousy sound again, Mario? What the hell is? I don't know what's wrong with my sound. It should be okay. Isn't it okay? No, you, no, you don't have okay. your headset tied into it. You need to change your. Let's microphone. ask Brad. Brad, if you would have had no money, would you have been better off or worse? So the, I was making more money. So when I was in tech, I was making eighty grand, and then I and I took a step back to make thirty some thirty eight grand because yeah, I saw the. You up. So I saw the commission side. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I mean, that $38,000 was pretty much like having nothing. 
quite frankly. Uh, you, but you, but you, yes, but but if I had no base salary, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I have a drive. It was just I didn't understand the industry uh, well enough. And then I started banging the phone, started doing all the things that you need to do to get people on the phone. And then I started to understand what kind of level of person is a is a company going to hire that they're going to pay a you know a, a fee on, or they're going to pay some kind of upcharge on. They need to be far superior than just having a pulse and having some kind of a skill or a, you know a keyword match. Hey, okay. at, what, at what at what point did confidence come in? It was probably after the first the first hire, the first two hires, because then I realized, okay, this is how it works. Uh, I was I was doing it because I thought it was easy because I thought, you know, I'm a confident person. I really thought oh, this is simple. I thought I knew it all from the get go, and then it was a, it was a wake up call uh, when I realized after that first hire. Okay, this is how it works. Then, then from there it was a snowball effect. It actually became very uh, not simple, but it became easier to to do. So, what did you do different? What was the first thing you did different? Really understanding the the client requirements because I was I was just being fed from the partner to the recruiter down to me. I was like this low level uh, type person. Blunky. Yeah. So I, I was getting more access to the clients. Actually, asking the deeper level technical questions, the understanding the culture understanding, you know, uh, what's most important, what are the non-negotiables, all those kind of things. So okay. once you had that, then you can get going. Mario wants to talk. I have to, let me just put two questions in the air so I don't forget. He just said he was got access to the clients. So I guess he didn't get a chance to ask them questions directly. He wasn't getting enough information, it sounds like uh, to me. And I already forgot the, the real bird. Oh yeah. What is, since you know what went wrong for you and what went right, if you were going to hire, in fact, you have hired people, I want to know how you would train them. But first, Mario, he's been waiting for a while. Go ahead. We can't hear a word you're saying, okay? Yeah, I could read your <laughs> I lips. Said, I, I kind of heard that lips. one. Huh? <laughs> okay, he'll Boy. answer one of my questions if, if until you come on. So were you getting access to the clients only later on? And were you, it sounds like you weren't, get, you weren't getting the information you needed in order to do a, a good job. No, I mean, keep in mind, this was, this was 15, 16 years ago, but, but, so what? but, but, but the reality is, yeah, I was never, I was never speaking to the client at all. And I said, guys, this is, this is ludicrous. I need, I need the information and I can't have it from like four people down. I need to have access to the client. And it's like, even for me, when I hire someone that's not seasoned or not, you know, doesn't know how to do this, uh, you have a fear of introducing someone to the client because you might, you may screw something up. You may say something silly and uh, you may lose that, that client. So that's maybe the thinking behind it. Cause I was from a technical background, but had really no sales experience, uh, and, uh, no recruitment experience, obviously. Okay. My experience with that, working on a team like that is that the person who sells a search is sucking up to the client and they don't want to ask tough questions because uh, it'll make them look like they don't know everything uh, automatically. And, and so the sourcer finally has to get access and get the real information and then can do a good job. Mario, are you online now? Can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yeah, go yes. ahead. Okay. Okay. So Brad, I just want to ask you a question. What were you doing in tech before you got into recruiting? I was doing IT support starting out, then I got, oh, I got into, uh, So you never had any sales experience uh, or dealing uh, experience dealing with customers, except for B2C, right? I mean, business to customer, correct? The only experience but I had- B2B. The only, no, the only experience I had was carrying people's mm. bags that own businesses. Yep. Okay. That makes total sense. I, I mean, no, see- but, Okay, so I'm curious, how did, you, how did you make that change? How did you pick that up? Yeah. Because you have a lot of recruiters- that know that think they know how to recruit very well, uh, and then when they but they don't go, go solo on their own, have no clients and are freaking out. And, and when they try to, it, it's uh, more miss than hit. Can, yes. I, can I, before you answer that question, can I ask this one question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> answer Michael G. No. Cox's question first. Go ahead. Yeah. So so the the senior recruiter who I was who I was paired with. <laughs> He was on a mission to fill jobs and not really help out. Although I was kind of, he was allowing me to see what he was doing. That's basically what was it. Uh, what was That's happening. training. Yeah. And, and then, and then my, my dad's, uh, I wouldn't even say that, I guess they were growing up buddies and we're talking probably teenagers. Uh, and he said, listen, come to my office and I'm going to give you the playbook on how to do this. And that's really what helped me understand the sales aspect, the marketing aspect, how to talk to clients, how to get clients, how to fill jobs you know, how to, how to delegate all those things. And, and that, and that took about four years for me to get up to speed 
and that, well, not at the speed, but there was four year plan for me to understand. Cause I told him, I, I, I want to start a business. And he said, listen, you can do this. If you stay with me for four years, go join a larger staffing and recruiting company, understand how they do it and then start your own business, but do not be in staffing recruiting your entire life. Like, like he was, that's, that was the advice that he, that he now, gave me. Now, who was the one that told you that? Guy's name is George Doherty. So his, his, his uh, company was called Doherty and Associates. Uh -huh. And that company was acquired by the company that I ultimately joined. Okay. Uh, the question I had was this, okay. You were told, Hey, you get your, your, you get a placement or you're fired. Well, I was there for three that, months. That, and, yeah, I, I may have had one placement, but it was, uh, it was, it was. Yeah. Not you got to pick up the pace, whatever. Yeah, right, exactly. At, at that very moment, I know many people have been told that, and some have probably been told that recently. What at that point did you do, as advice to other people? Yeah, so I, I doubled down. Uh, is, is is what I did. I started asking more questions because I, I was fearful that they were going to fire my ass, quite frankly, and. Mm -hmm. uh, most people that I find uh, when the going gets tough, like when that pressure comes on, they just pack up and go. And even when I hire, I'm looking at resumes now from recruiters. And what do I see? Three months, five months, six months of jobs. And it's like over and over. And they think, and they think it's something's going to change by joining another you know, recruiting company. And the answer is you have to double down and, and really understand the root of how this all works. Most people are surface level. Like I wanted to get to the, to, to, to the depths of understanding the client. I want to speak to the client to understand what's going on. Because that ultimately was was the trigger point for me to realize, like, okay, this is what they're looking for versus just an A plus uh, certification at the time, and really investigating things I didn't know in tech deeper, beyond the okay, keyword. Okay, okay, I, I, I'm really confused about this. How do you train your own people? Because you've got staff, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. So, so I I train them. I train them. Uh, you know, so I I rely heavily on sourcers. So the sourcing for us is the starting point to make sure that we're finding the right prospects. So, and we have a, a clear <laughs> standards that, that we've identified that, that are- What up, Rich? So, <laughs> so, so for us, we're doing a lot of x-ray search, like stuff beyond the keywords, skills mapping, talent mapping, really targeting- okay, Yeah, I want to go into your sourcing stuff, but first I want to tell you, I looked it up. Uh, oh, Patrick Watson is the name of the actor. I never would have uh, got it, okay? Patrick Watson. Oh, we're we're all going to go Google search this That's right the guy. now. <laughs> yeah, go Google. It looks just like him. He looks I'll, I'll put it in the chat, like but hey, Patrick let Brad Watson. get to- let Brad get to the training. Okay. No, no. Hold on. One, one second. Here's, he says, he's you asked him to talk. about his training. Yeah. But first he went straight into the sourcing thing and he's got uh, a three level of sourcing, which I don't really understand. He's there's a, what I would call, he says like a keyword jockey. That's someone who does Boolean searches and searches on LinkedIn and yeah. command F finder, which I don't know. What's, what's this keyword jockey, uh, Brad? Yeah, a keyword jockey is someone that you say, okay, we need a certain, you know, set of skills. And they will only, they'll highlight, they'll look online for these skills. And that's all, that's all they can see. They can't see beyond the keyword. They, they can't connect the dots of if someone is working at a company and they have a certain skill set to identify how many other people are working at that company that may not have the keyword listed on their profile somewhere, but they actually are, are working with that particular technology. So yeah. they don't understand the job. They understand the job, but they're 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 only looking at people based on job <clears throat> title or keyword in the profile. Okay, what's Command F? Am I stupid for not knowing what he's referring to there? Yes. There's two questions. Yes, yes you are. And go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, control like Command F or Control F in in the rest of the world? Yeah, Control F. Yeah. yeah. So Does everybody it, know what is it? Tell 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 because yeah. I have I have an audience of it's people a who search, don't man. know. All right. All, all all you're doing on your keyboard is you're you're, you're searching for for a word. On, it, a, on a page yeah, it comes up on a prompt so if, if depending if you have a mac or or a pc you, you you hit that you hit that on your keyboard and then it shows up okay i want to find this word that's basically what a what a keyword jockey is they're just trying to find python if they don't see python that's that's the extent that they go to to see if if that person uh, has the skill set or not they're not okay, going so to one level they're not going that's, to that's not a good thing right no <laughs> okay so or, or, second level he's got a, he's got a second level but hold, second. hold on to close out the first level, you, you know you found a, a, a great keyword uh, uh, jockey or junkie, if you will, um, if you ask for Python and they send you a bunch of results from national zoos. Right. right. <laughs> or recruiters who recruit Python uh, developers, okay? See, Michael, they seem Michael to like that one. Questions. Michael like that one. <laughs> okay. His second level is the talent mapper, okay? Mm. People who understand business beyond the keyword and they know how to raid 
raid companies based on tech stack, industry, sector, location, culture, when keywords are not present. Want to elaborate on that? Does that make sense to everybody? But you go ahead. Yeah, that's yeah, huge. So, that's so, so a, a really good sourcer, uh, I, I almost refer to them as like a leech. Once they get onto a company, you, you really want to raid, or I also call them Vikings as well. You're, you're at that company. You, you might as well raid the, the leadership that's there to, for new business development opportunities. You want to raid the people that, that meet the client requirements, but also meet our, our company standards that we have set for ourselves. And, and, and this is what we've realized. You know, these standards are, are really sitting above the client requirements. But the, 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 the skills mapping is understanding the technology stacks. How many technology stacks are at the company? Is it just one? Do they have legacy technology stacks? How many engineers are, are working there? All these things are puzzle pieces you need to put together to really unravel to understand you know, how, many, how many folks could be a fit, even if the keyword is not showing. Okay, so that takes a lot of industry knowledge to assess a company on that basis. Am I right? Anybody with me? No? I'll leave it to Brad. Okay. Well, and the final one, it's I don't get it. It's it's like sounds like automated sourcer. They deeply understand the logic behind the data, allowing the information of companies and people to flow inward based on mastering stages one and two. Tell me what that means. Yeah. So what, what you're doing, once you understand the logic behind how you're sourcing, understanding beyond just the Boolean search and what it's producing, you're, you're able to create simple Google alerts that, that are set up where you don't have to do the manual searching anymore. And the information starts flowing to you versus you constantly having to go after it. So anytime something hits the web, bang, it comes right to you versus you constantly having to search for it all day long. What's an example uh, of that? So for example, it would be uh, you, you can monitor a company page. You, you can monitor uh, you know, uh, uh, certain profiles. You're basically monitoring the web through Google alerts to understand, okay, I'm, I'm looking for people that have Python, you know, React, AWS experience, let's say. And I'm looking, I'm, and, and you find certain companies or people that are working at companies that, that that's the skill set that they're working with. So then you start creating Google alerts for each company, each company, uh, each like for the job openings, for, for people on the move. All those things can be automated where you no longer have to go out to search for it because once you understand how to find it, you should be able to set up a Google alert so it comes to you. So you do that as a Google alert rather than a LinkedIn alert? Yeah, because Google, Google Alert, it, LinkedIn is only one platform. Google's scraping everything. Yeah, I, I use Google Alerts to track candidates you send out. That way you can see if you're <clears throat> someone snaked them or not. And, you know, with oh, that, your client idea. without uh, uh, checking with you. Yeah, Google, I have a question. Google Alert is a, is a tool that most I find that most most people aren't using to, to I mean, it's, it's one of the best tools out there if you know how to use it correctly. So with regards to LinkedIn, since sourcing is a big oh, deal, for you, it sounds like. Uh, you, you, what about the Google X-ray? Do you, you prefer the Google X-ray to a LinkedIn search? Is that right? <clears throat> but we, we don't call it the Google X-ray. <laughs> <laughs> X-ray, X-ray search is, is far superior, uh, based on when you look at LinkedIn recruiter, you look at all the tools that are out there. Again, the ability to, to go beyond LinkedIn is the critical, critical factor here. Not every single person is on LinkedIn that, that, that's out there. So your ability to understand the logic behind the Boolean search, uh, you know, and how and what the client's asking for, and understanding that job titles are different at all companies. You have to understand the size of the company, how long the company's been around for, uh, you know, the size of the team. All these things play into really identifying beyond the keyword of what you're looking for. Brett, how did you learn all this stuff? <laughs> yeah, especially since you were a, a loser. Right? No, the, the the reason, reason I asked you to get fired. The reason the reason I ask is is you know I was talking to Brian Fink and we we're talking about how people become good sourcers and what what route do they take and and where do they go. So yeah. I'm asking you from yeah. zero to now. So when I from when zero I, to hero, that's what he wanted to say, right? Yeah, no, when I, when I yeah, good, yeah, that's what, yeah, yeah, that's a ticket. Yeah, no, it's a good question because when when you really think about what recruiting is, uh, you have to understand and appreciate business, you know, understanding how organizations are structured, what the goals are. Like it's, it's not, I find a lot of recruiters are just, they're, they're pissed off all the time because they don't understand why things aren't happening, but they don't understand business. So part of it, a big part of the, the trans, the, the transformation is understanding business as a whole, but then understanding, you know, setting, setting some standards for yourself, just because they have certain things, just because the client says five plus years of this, which is typically made up. What's the difference between four to five years or five to six years? Uh, and then on top of that, beyond the keyword, uh, and you start to understand, okay, what makes money and start to recognize the signs and patterns. 
the signs and patterns are really, once you develop those, you're just setting yourself some standards based on that. And that's what transforms, you know, someone from understanding how this works to someone that struggles to, to do this. Okay, but he was asking, how did you learn to be a Boolean expert? Research, curiosity, asking people. Did you take any of those courses from Irina or? No, you just need ChatGPT. It'll do it for you. No, but he's before Chat. That was that was last month. Before last month. Yeah. Well, how, how did now, you learn you Boolean? Did you take Boolean courses like the Airs training or anything like that? Uh, Airs training. I never did any of the <laughs> training or Arena's courses, but I but. Uh, Gosh, what was the lady's name? Barb Bruno was was big back in the day when I would get a lot of uh, tips from from her. But really, I got the tips actually from that senior technical recruiter that I was paired with. He did show me Boolean search. That was one of the things he did. He did share, uh, and then just going deeper into it, you know, going on going online to to see, you know, and and, and there was people out there talking about Boolean search at the time. So really going through and and uh, you know, playing. you taught yourself primarily. Is that right? He gave you the yeah. basic idea, and then you. Built on it yourself. Is that what you're telling us? Yeah, that's correct. Anybody else got a question for him? I got lots. Anybody got a question for him? No? You're okay. allowed to ask him one more question. Okay, Brad. T oh, Brad. Way, oh, oh, I wanted to hear how he uh, trained people. That was. Go ahead. He didn't want to talk about it, but we asked him. Go ahead. Brad. No, Cut him no. off. No, absolutely. So when, when someone joins here, I spend a month with them or 30 days with them understanding and going through, okay, this is our process. These are the tools, obviously all, all the, all the basic things that you would need to understand to be successful here. And then, and then really defining and looking at, okay, this is how we do x-ray search. And then, and then showing them through screen share, you know, let's play with, let's play with the Boolean search. Let's, let's understand beyond the keywords and start to do things like skills mapping, talent mapping. And within 30, within the first week, someone understands the process. And then it's really Trying to trying to get them to a point of understanding. Okay, uh, the client requirements are one thing. You have to meet the client requirements, and for us, like our, we average about thirty thousand dollars fees. So when 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 I when you talk to someone, especially someone that's somewhat new to sourcing or even senior in sourcing, they have you have to understand that these candidates have to be they have to meet all the requirements plus the preferences. If you're missing out on those things, if you're giving that client an out to say no, we chose someone else. That's the hardest thing. A lot of it is just getting through the mental uh, or, or the mindset of that person of, of how the job works. And then week two is really refining because at that point they're doing the extra research. They may struggle to find the companies, and then they start to they start to either go down a certain rabbit hole that's that's uh, you know you're going to get all these great candidates, or you're going on a rabbit hole where you're just finding a bunch of not so great candidates. And I'm working through those things with them in week two. By week three, you know they, they're they're starting to see oh these are these are these are people that are getting screens submitted interviewing. By week four, we should be getting offers and, and hires. So it's really staying with them for those first thirty days, and then staying with them for sixty ninety days. But it's not really every single day. The first month is every single day with them. Mm -hmm. When you and do you hire right? people with functional experience, uh, or or do they have to have a tech background or anything like that? I will hire both. I will hire people that have uh, the the folks that have a technical background that meaning not in sourcing or recruiting. Those people tend not to work out. Uh, wow, that's what Richie Rich says. Why is that? Yeah, we we well, what we found is that they try to do their their their, their thought process. There are people like you, you weren't working out, right? Exactly. And you had to exactly. Because I'm, I'm I was constantly thinking about instead of you know making money real quick, I was constantly thinking about how can I improve this, but it would take too long. And and the partners are saying, listen, we need we need the seats filled now. That this isn't going to last forever. That these roles are open for. That's where I was failing. And then technical people, especially on the development and engineering side, they want to try to build something and automate something right from the get-go, but they don't understand how the manual process works. And they'll die on the vine to me before they, they even get to, to one placement. Really? I am shocked. Richie Rich, you're not shocked, are you? I'm not shocked. What That's the, what, what you the say greatest? all the time. <clears throat> this functional experience doesn't mean anything. Is that what you're saying? Who, me? Okay. Yeah, you. Yeah, excuse yeah. me. I'm trying to get work done here. You're bothering me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. You just go back to work. We're, we're the white want... noise in the background. Yeah. yeah. The functional stuff is great, but you can't let it over consume. <clears throat> I just had this conversation this morning with another recruiter. You know, you, 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 oh, people over rotate and trying to get this perfection instead of progress, and you get nothing done. You just, you know, this is recruiting is not a, not a perfect science. If you're not, it sales isn't a perfect science. You know, people are gonna buy the people they like. You could be 80% of what they're looking for, but have the right personality and beat up the guy that's a slam dunk fit. Okay, I'm very impressed though that Brad says he can bring a person up within a month 
to have the kind of uh, 360 it's not perspective. That hard. If someone's got the right, if someone's got the aptitude to learn and wants to, you know, read up on their industry, understand the jargon, it's not that hard. You make a few phone calls, you listen to a few folks. It's not. I mean, it shouldn't take. It shouldn't take take a month for most people. It should take a, a week. Brad, okay. Brad, how many how many people work with you, Brad? Altogether, we have seventeen sourcers, and then we have uh, recruiting wow. operations folks, um, and then we have contractors that uh, obviously we're we're billing out. Um, but you know, to to Rich's point, like the other thing is like people that are into tools, they will constantly talk about tools, and 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 they'll get into that rabbit hole. And they're they're folks so focused on that versus trying to fill positions. That that's the other class of people that that I find. Um, and by no means it, the the training that I do is perfect. I mean, usually when we hire someone, day one and day two are the most critical days where where we find people that you know resign because it's either too fast paced. They thought it was something that it's not. Uh, that they only want to do is help people find jobs. And, and we try to vet this out during during the the interviews. And we have an assessment that they take to to make sure that they understand what this role is. Uh, we ask them to find three candidates and we give them some of the tools we use to be able to do that and give some instruction because we want to see how curious that person is. Uh, and uh, the curiosity is, is what is what we're looking for, because those you people. Know what? You mentioned uh, Rich and Rich said if he was starting again, he would have a, a narrower niche, a geo niche, geographic and maybe a, a smaller technical niche. I, I can't mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what he meant. But you started for like eight years just working uh, on tech people within 60 miles of Philadelphia, right? That's correct. So, yeah. So, I, so what, when I was working at this, uh, this so when I, left for the, when I left the smaller agency, the boutique agency, they were probably about like an $8 million uh, you know, agency. Uh, and I went to a larger company. Um, uh, at that time, I started this, this group called IT Pros Philadelphia. It was a networking group. That was in 2009. So I was I was gearing myself up through the networking group to then start my company in 2011. So having advanced, really focused in on Philadelphia, and and these were back in office jobs. There was really no remote work being done at at, at that time. So I I became not necessarily a figurehead, but I I had all these people, and the, the community at the time was growing and growing and growing, like 4,000 people, and we're getting jobs, and it was easier to to do to do that. But again, I was really focused in on tech, IT infrastructure, you know, development, engineering, tech leadership. Yeah, but my point was that in the end, you decided that having uh, such a narrow niche wasn't necessary anymore for some greater success. It was the it was the geography. So so that that was successful, but it, you get more success by just you know scaling and, and replicating what you're doing in, <clears throat> in location. So now we're in all of North America, uh, and uh, we still focus in on you know typically you know Series A you know through uh, you know to to less public companies, but. These are these these are your companies that typically will have an office and then have multiple offices or locations, and we just piggybacked off of, of off of their office presence to fill jobs and expand from there. Anybody, Brad? Brad, the the um, a lot of recruiters right now are looking for jobs. A lot of a lot of people you want to help out, you can't help out. If they were going to interview with an agency, a firm like yours, what what advice could you give them? Yeah, so I'm I'm looking at them right now. Actually, before I was on this call, we, we received within an hour, we received 177 applications from people uh, from all different, mainly from corporate. You know, these are your your metas, your your bigger name companies that were people were laid off. On the agency side, we see people as well. The, the number one thing that I that I that I don't see uh, is numbers. Everyone puts in what ATS they're using. You know, they're able to do, they're filling these kind of jobs. But I never see how many jobs, what kind of fees are we talking about? I'm not seeing any kind of numbers that are associating, you know, I'm looking for data driven type people that understand the numbers, not just the tools. Uh, and, and those people that understand the tools and understand how to keyword search, it's a dime a dozen. And uh, unfortunately, we reject those folks. We also reject folks that if we can't see uh, them establishing themselves anywhere, they're just going three months here, six months there. And, and, and we see like... 10 jobs in 10 years, like that's, and that's, that's again, a lot of the recruiters that we're seeing, like just try to hunker down at a place, figure it out and, and double down and make it happen versus just think that I'm going to, what am I going to be the next uh, name on the resume that you're going to have my company on there? And you're going to go do it, do it again. And again, you're going to blame me that we couldn't get the job done. And we have clients that pay, you know, every job, as you know, it's there, these aren't easy jobs because they, they, the, the, co the company would fill it themselves. Brad, but, do you guys do you guys just do tech tech roles or what do you do? 
we do, I would say 90% of what we do is tech, but once we get into a company, some companies, like I would say sub 50 employees, they'll usually give us all their roles from marketing to executive assistant to all that stuff. Um, but yeah, 90% of what we're doing is, is tech, usually in that 150 to $300,000, you know, pay rate. And what, what's the name, what's the name of your company? IT pros. So it pros philly.com. So when you hire somebody and you're interviewing them, what is your one key question that you ask that separates the winners from the losers? I guess what walk, walk me through the numbers. What did you do in the past year? Uh, and, and then break it down for me. And what we yeah, find sounds like a sales recruiter. Well, when they, when they can't break it down, or when they they say a number like, oh, I made $200,000 last year, or I made $300,000. I hear a lot of that, like people trying to make themselves bigger than what they are. But then when I ask them, okay, break me down. Okay, what are the salaries? What are the fees? What, how much are you making? They, I can tell instantly they're they're, they're full of crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it's so the, the overwhelming majority of the people that I speak to in sales, <clears throat> they, they still don't do that same thing that you're looking for, which oh, is yeah. quantify First of all, add results, actual results, instead of just duties and, and, and responsibilities on your resume, add some results and then quantify those results. They, they don't do it. And, and, and it's like, hey, Mike, you watch my video on how to write a resume. See, I love it. Oh, did <laughs> yeah. I? No, I have not. But, <laughs> but I, that's what it, I mean. Also, if you're doing a sales resume, it's, <clears throat> yes, you it, sold it's, what you sold and how you did. I mean, it's very simple. There's nothing yes, but, but like uh, Brad was mentioning, sometimes I say, oh, yeah, I did 300,000 last year. What's your, and then you just ask like three follow-up questions. What's the average deal size? Yeah. What was your, your base salary and what's your typical percentage? What's your average take home on a deal? And suddenly those numbers don't add up and you start wondering where those numbers are coming my, from. My favorite is when they can't remember who they sold to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who'd you sell? Who was your biggest deal last year? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, what'd you sell them? It was oh. nine months ago, jackass. <laughs> what do you guys say to these people when you catch them lying? Uh, Brad, what do you say? You're full of you're full. You're of lucky I caught just... you and before you spoke to no, me. I, I don't I don't want to make them feel bad. I just because they they you could see their their demeanor change when they realize that they're not gonna fool me. And it's not that I know it all, it's just because they're 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 bumbling you ask the right around. questions. I mean you ask yeah, like, bumbling you. around and then I say, Well, how are you making 200 grand? If you told me your base salary is 75 grand and when you really work the numbers of how your commission was paid, you're really only making $2,500 on each deal. So that means, and then I would walk through like, so you did 75 placements last year? And they're like, oh my gosh. And they're like, they're like oh yeah, you called me basically. Yeah. And this isn't the right fit, uh, but good luck with your search and that's the end of it. Yeah, unless unless the overwhelming majority of their commissions came from that. You guys, uh, Rich and, bonus. and Rich and and Mike, uh, do you do the same thing when you ask those yeah. questions and they can't answer? Them? You say so long, or do you? Are yeah, you I just say, listen. Here? Once you go back and figure it out, and then we can talk. You know, I mean, and they they never call you back. It, so Mike, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. And I'll, I'll, you have to be upfront and say, look, right now the, the way you've outlined these numbers, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And imagine if you were in front of an actual. Uh, hiring manager and they don't make sense you, you don't want to be in that situation and, or, and so i'll try and give them an opportunity to explain those numbers once again yeah but i usually you just tell them because either i mean the guys that i'm dealing with i mean mics are i think are i think are a little bit lower level than the guys i deal with you know my guys are like 150 plus thousand dollar base salaries i mean i just tell them listen my manager would eat you for lunch if you interviewed and gave this kind of an answer and then they just get all you know so you just, they just get all nervous and flustered and they're like, okay. <laughs> and so, but this is the you thing know. about Rich, okay? I just have to keep stressing this because I want to model myself like that. <laughs> yeah. He could say anything, you know? The manager's <laughs> going to eat you for lunch, but he stays happy. He, yeah. doesn't, confront <laughs> he doesn't say, you know, this because is terrible. You're not, you're not saying it insultingly. You're, you're telling no, him. It's like, it's just, you're just helping the guy out. It's like, listen, I mean, what, what am I going to, like, like, like Mike gives this nice, you know, very polite answer. I don't have time for that. I've got 80 <laughs> and... I don't care. These guys are professional sellers. They get their head kicked in every day. It's like, listen, this is the problem. Fix it. All right. What this am is I going to answer for everything? I got ADD. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Everyone's got something now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Brad, before I forget, there's a question going back a half hour. You said that your father's uh, gang member, partner, friend, uh, also, he told you, look, stay here for, uh, what was it, four years, he said, then go to a bigger firm. Why was it, and you did that, why was it important to go to a bigger firm? What did you, 
gain there that you didn't already have after a few years at what you call the boutique firm? Yeah, well, he, he just wanted me to experience what it was like working at a larger company, doing larger revenues, understanding just the headaches of something larger versus smaller. The the boutique probably, we probably had about, I don't know, maybe 20 people and a secretary that was working there in an office type setting. Um, the company that I joined was larger. There was probably about 700 people in, in different locations throughout throughout the U.S., and it was just understanding how that dynamic worked versus a one in like a one in office type of type of type of dynamic environment. So and that the seven hundred people was seven hundred recruiters, staffing, and everything else. Or was it a company? Oh, these are, yeah, these are office administrators, you know, VPs, uh, you know, directors, managers, recruiters. Uh, this this company would have the recruiter would be doing the sourcing, recruiting, screening. What I call the traditional send to the account manager. The account manager then sends it to the to sends it to the client. Okay. I have a, the next question is about tech stack, but first you offered to come on the show. I'm, I'm interested in what you've been telling us, but was there something specific that you wanted to talk about? Did you want to promote your, your company or, or just ask questions here or, or talk about something specific? Do you have any real ish fun issues that you want got on your mind? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, we're 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 hiring. We're um, we're hiring always sourcers. So sourcing is something that's very very important to 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 my to my company. Where whether you have experience or not, I I will look at both and I value different time zones. Uh, so that that's one thing. Although that's more of a of a pitch. Wait, to, to wait the, can I ask you how much do you guys pay your sources? If that's not uh, too personal. Uh, so watching you're this anyway. Looking for a job, Rich? Hey, but you never know. <laughs> Part time. <laughs> So, so for for us, the, we're we're a performance based environment. So the sourcers are are earning a commission uh, on on each on each hire that they're making. So the sourcer here earns fifteen percent of the fee, and they're just profiling the information to then send it to to the recruiter. So are they do they screen the candidate? Though? Are they picking up the phone and talking to someone? Or just fifteen no. percent? I could do that. Oh, well, they're a that. traditional yeah. sourcer, the kind who just finds people, right? So they're finding people. They they will send out. Uh, we have a, a video questionnaire that that. Uh, that they send out initially to to see if if the prospects are interested in either our service or uh, or a particular role that we're that we're curating or targeting them for. So then they 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 do the initial outreach, and then from there the the recruit. Yeah, the recruit they don't they don't do a phone screen like uh, like Rich just. Yeah, no, no they're they're, they're just looking at the profile and seeing if the resumes match. That's yeah, well, that's what I consider a source who really does. <laughs> Mario, do you have anything? He seems like a guy that you would like to talk to. Do you have any questions you want to ask? No, no, I'm just I'm listening to everything you say. So that's go got to create a lot of information. So you said you have 17 sourcers, and and they they must be creating just massive either spreadsheets or Google Docs or just massive amounts of information. How are you bringing all of that together for your 17 to make it effective beyond just today's search? Yeah, so so really what we think about, like when I started the company, the whole goal was to, to be this staffing recruiting, technology staffing recruiting company. But really at, at the core, and I'm not, this isn't really a secret, we're, we're really, we've been collecting this data for that period of time to then build something larger beyond just you know filling seats, right? So yeah. when, when you're collecting the data on companies, so the sources are collecting data on companies, technology stacks, they're also tracking uh, you know, uh, if, they're if they're growing or dying. So we can understand the companies that are growing, we wanna work with, the companies that are dying, we wanna recruit source from. So they understand all those, all those dynamics beyond like what's basically out there. So uh, when we're storing all that information today into a tool called Asana, uh, which is really a project management tool, yeah. but it's really at the core, it's just it's really just a spreadsheet if you think about it, just hyped up. Now Asana is now a public company, uh, founded by Dustin, who was one of the co-founders of Facebook. He's obviously a billionaire and makes a whole bunch of money. Mm -hmm. But but taking that information, it could be a it could be a JSON, it could be a, 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 a spreadsheet, and we can now could take that and put it into whatever else. As we as we continue to scale up into into a, another database, uh, as how we do they decide if a company's growing or or, or dying? What what uh, data are they looking at? That's where LinkedIn comes in. So that that's that's one of the valuable information. So you could see how many employees they have. So like last year, we could say that company had six hundred thirty employees, and then a year from now or today, let's say from last year, we now see they have one thousand six hundred some people, and then and then through the Google alert, we could see was there an acquisition. Or are they just growing organically, and then we could target to do business with them? Uh, or if they're dying, we then target them and continue rating from that company because something is going on in a negative way that creates uncertainty that makes it easier for us to, to source people and recruit people from. And, and so uh, um, my go assumption ahead. is that Brett. two years from now, you can go into Asana and somehow do a search um, 
for either companies that are shrinking um, and then and then also do a search. We need to find out which organizations have this specific uh, you know, tech stack of three things and, and you can do that search. And then that spits out prospective candidates in, in, in mass. Yeah, so pro candidate prospects as well as people that are coming and going. So where are they going to? Where do they come from? And then what's the technology stack and how many technology stacks do they have? And what's the size of the engineering department? Where are those engineers located? Are they all in a specific geography? Because they like, and also understanding, are they working hybrid? Are they working remotely? Are they working in office? Do they, are they offshoring? So all these things where we're putting together these puzzle pieces to make better sense of what's going on. And over time, that's the competitive advantage that we have over the, what I was talking about earlier, the, the, the basic keyword searcher. Because we now, could last question in regards to this. If you were talking to uh, you know, John Smith and you see that he's been at these four companies and you guys have mapped them out, can I then at one glance look that individual up in that system, see each of the companies and then see which tech stacks he's been playing in? Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So, um, there's, Based there's on your research, right? Yeah, so, there, so there's there's the candidate, and then that's that's what the that's what the sources do here. They're doing the research. Ninety percent of the job of a sourcer here is research to understand. Okay, he worked there. Where he worked before. We're not going. We have a certain standard of not going back too far because then the technology stack may have changed. Mm -hmm. So so it's really only going back for the past job uh, if it, if it's relevant, like meaning in the past couple of years. Uh, and then understanding where they're going, uh, so then we could, so we know that there's a potential backfill depending on when when he or she left. Then to understand, okay, is the company growing or dying? Then that's where the new business development opportunities come into play. And then also we're profiling, you know, that manager or trying to profile depending on the size of the company. Is it a director we're targeting? Is it the manager? It could even be a lead to understand, you know, who's who's that person potentially interviewing those folks. And basically, we're using our own clients uh, to not only fill roles. But to use them as new business develop, development opportunities with those candidates, all this is is creating like this infinity loop of trading and replacing. We didn't Brad. even get to business development. I want to welcome David Marr. Something must be special about T Brad for him to show his face. Okay, usually he's up in heaven. He's uh, I don't know. <laughs> Brad, thanks yeah. for the info. Just feel, the yeah. Just feel I like the picture better. better. <laughs> okay, should we no. ask him for his tech stack or about uh, business development? Because we're running let's out of time. Let's do this tech stack. I want to hear a text, what stack he's using for. Okay, we browser, oh. contact, info finder, LinkedIn automation, email the, automation. The unique stuff, not the boring crap that everyone else is using. What's what's different that you're using? Yeah, so from the from a tools from a tools perspective, to find contact details. I mean, this isn't rocket science. We use we use a number of different ones, but the primary one that we use is Sales QL. Uh, that seems to, and, and what we're targeting is we need information on both the, like the, the company email address, but we also need the personal information because in our case, we're dealing mainly with senior people. They're, they're considered a candidate prospect as well as a client prospect. So that's how we're, that's how we're trying. We, we need to find those, those details. I mean, there's, we probably have 30 or 40 different, different tools we're using to find contact details. And if we can't find the contact details, that's that's where the networking comes into play. That's where connecting with that person on LinkedIn comes into play. Again, that's where LinkedIn becomes a value. We found that the LinkedIn messaging platform is far more superior than uh, sending it through. You know, uh, we use Gmail for business or work, whatever it's being called today. Um, that reaches the candidate or the prospect uh, in a greater capacity than it would for, uh, really? sending it. Mm -hmm. Brad, let me let me ask you this quick question. You talked about having a number of sources. You talk about paying them a percentage. Uh, let him let him finish his tech stack, Ernie. Let him finish. Wait, wait, no, no. The question is this: How long do they have ownership of anyone that they've sourced? Yeah, that so, question has nothing to do with the tech stack, Ernie. <laughs> I don't Ernie, care about the. I don't Ernie, care about the tech we'll stack. Get, I want we'll, to ask not, you, Ernie. We'll get back to your question. Let's <laughs> keep so I can I can I can edit it properly as well. Okay, contact info finder SQL. You're you're doing sales sales uh, sales QL. <laughs> QL sorry, um, and uh, what's the next one you want to talk about? So Asana, which we which we talked about, that's where we store all the information. That's what browser do you like? Because that's an issue for us now here. What well, browser? Uh, so we use Chrome here. Chrome. Okay, you know, uh, is, Rich isn't says that kind of I'll give Rich memory. says Edge is just as good. Although I think that I just is, made my switch to it. Edge is far better than Chrome. It yeah. combines less, uh, consumes okay. less memory. 
Okay. Is what about LinkedIn so automation? Are you using any uh, LinkedIn automation? We looked at like job in and, and things of that nature. And, and the problem is the sourcers get, get constantly restricted. Um, we constantly have to do workarounds to not get restricted. So we, we try not to, to use really any LinkedIn automation tools uh, because we, I was just getting weekly people getting shut down. And I wow. Was Wow, you've got all those sources, and you're not using any. Uh, Rich uses uh, contacts. Makes like you lazy, man. Day. Okay, uh, a question, Brad. How how big is your team generally? It isn't. How big is your sources. team? He's the sources. It's, he's got seventeen. One seven. Is that right? Holy yeah, we have seven. Yeah. yeah, but is isn't sales QL fit into that category of going into LinkedIn? It does, and that, so that that that's the problem. So so that's why we use alternative. Uh, so we have about fifty tools that we use, and then so once once the sourcer gets shut down from LinkedIn, we remove sales QL from the equation. Then they, then they're using other tools that that aren't scraping that information inside of LinkedIn. So do so what do you, do you find that to be a problem? I use sales QL. Is that a problem with uh... the amount of volume that they're? That, so that's why we use X Ray Search because they're moving so quickly to find the to find the information. That yeah. even Google Google will stop will stop them to do the security check, and then so it, it, it's it's a volume type of play, both from a manual perspective and an automated perspective. Even if there's if there's no automation in play, they will still get shut down because of the amount of uh, of work they're doing from a manual perspective in, in in conjunction with the automation. Wow. Okay. Well, well Rich uh, wants you to get to okay. Let's answer the email automation, and then Rich wants to know what unique things you're using that we might not be. Uh, familiar with if you want to share yeah so email automation we use for the sequence and we use mixmax um you know to, to to do that um we use mail mail tracker and mail track to see uh who is you know opening up and for how long and all that kind of stuff we're also using loom uh which i know rich i've seen your your loom uh videos out there pitching jobs uh we also use a tool called video ask that's that's a video, video what video ask by typeform Video ask is a, a tool where you can have a video and a questionnaire at the same time. So describe, and then there's some logic behind each selection. That's been, that's been a unique advantage. And I'm not, I'm not saying something that's going to you know hurt us. If you guys even start using it, because you can use it a million different ways for both new business and as well as uh, reaching out to, to prospective candidates. Can, and then we is, use, can I ask you a question? Is video ask kind of like a hinter, interview? Have you tried interview? Yeah, we've seen interview. Video ask is, uh, in my opinion, and I don't know the guys that interview, but um, video ask is, uh, I think, easier and far more superior. Uh, but it's more of like, let's say it's me saying, far okay, less cheap. it's far cheaper. Holy Toledo. Yeah. So I, it would be like me saying, like, OK, uh, tell me and I'll just use an example. Tell me, uh, you know, what kind of base salary if we're talking about full time permanent positions, what kind of base salary would you uh, be looking for like to start? And we can introduce opportunities above there. And then, and then, so you're describing what the options are in a video and then they select it. And then based on their selection, you put some logic behind their selection and then it takes them on a different journey depending on their selection. And then ultimately the goal is to get them on the phone with you or to, or to take them to a next step that, you know, equates to either pitching. That's interesting. Or, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good one. And then we use smart recruiters for ATS. We don't, we don't really, we post jobs, but these jobs are really to collect data. I mean, yeah. we probably do about a quarter of a million, you know, dollars in, in applicants, but, and, and I use it for, for hiring internally here, but we're not, the, the, the applicants that we're getting for our client opportunities, there's, I mean, they're, we're getting thousands and, you know, we're lucky if we place any of them, but what those people do lead us to, they're giving us the data, they're working out companies that then we do the skills mapping and talent mapping to find out, okay, who are the targets that we really want? Where do you place those ads? So for the recruiters on, on smart recruit, that's an ATS. So but where, where do you, what job boards are you placing? Oh, your it just goes out, I think it goes out to like 21 different, it's like an aggregator. It goes out to 21 different types, LinkedIn and wherever else it goes. And then, and then we get, so it'll go automatically to our LinkedIn, I think our company page. And then, and then uh, we, get, we get a lot of applicants from, from there. Again, they're, they're typically not a fit for what we're looking for. However, the data does lead to, to what we are looking for. Ernie, your turn. No, I was going to say you, issues within sourcers and recruiters and that whole thing. When you have a sourcing person, a person that finds candidates, how long do they have ownership of that particular candidate? Yeah, so it's a good question. So typically uh, how it works here in Asana, they, they tag the job order to that prospect. And then as long as that as long as that job order is open, they have ownership of that of that particular candidate. If for whatever reason they like let's say another job order comes in and they fail to connect those dots that 
that candidate meets that criteria and they're just slow to get there. Well, that's part of the game. If, if the client doesn't care if, we're, if if you're slow to get there, they want they want to fill that position. So if another sourcer finds that same candidate and then tags into that new job order, well, then that then that particular job order is with that other sourcer than the original sourcer that found that person. Now, are, do you have one database that you use for everybody, or is they separate databases? Very, yeah, it's very transparent. Everyone can see every stage, who does what, what time they did. Everything's time stamped. You can see trucks commission, the whole nine yards. Everything is there to see who has ownership. And if a deal goes through, what stage are they at? Are they screening? Are they submitted? Are they interview? Are we waiting for interview feedback, interview prep, interview to brief, offer, hire, commission? So, so do they so get paid? Do they? Let me just ask, do they get paid for the people they pull out of your applicant tracking system the same way if they discover a new candidate? Yeah. 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 So, so, the, so applicants, so applicants are only because applicants. Really There's mm -hmm. a really good idea. The best experience possible. We'd really like to know you as well. The first thing that would be really useful. What's to going on? Size of your uh, hang on. So how many people work? <laughs> <in your restaurant>? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, so okay. applicants applicants just there so the the sourcing is is already so the the sourcer will go in and look at the applicant to extract the data and then from there that leads them to again the applicants are usually it's the recruiter's job to look at the applicant and they're just calling the applicant to to do a screen right then and there so it, it skips the sourcing stage however the sourcers are looking at the data from that resume to then see if they can raid other people that are at that same company or the previous company wow uh, Ernie, hey, did you have you want to finish? finish yeah, off? I was going to say having you have you have the do you have four stages that you would involve, or would you just have the sourcing and the recruiter? Do other recruiters get to join in on the sourcing? So it's sourcing, recruiting, yes. sourcing, recruiting, screening. The, yeah. the sourcer is designed to find the candidate and client prospect and to put the puzzle pieces together about the company, so we understand the technology stacks. And then it goes on to the recruiter. The recruiters, that the, their main function is to get that person on the phone, right? So once they get them on the phone, then they're doing the screening. So the recruiter is usually doing the screening and, and then doing the interview prep. We don't have an account manager. The person that's talking to the candidate is the one that's that's talking to the client. So there's no, no handoff where I'm saying, hey, Ernie, I screened this person. You're the account manager. Now can you present them? You really know nothing be, you know, about that candidate, and it creates more chaos with the candidate because you're now handing off to so many people. Yeah, I agree. Who the hell is who? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know what? The, the thing it strikes me is these uh, sourcers are doing such an intensive job on one company. They, they must be spending a lot of time when, for, for things they don't get paid for because they're only paid for candidates so they're getting paid for the hire where where the riches are is that every time they're profiling a company that needs that leads to a new client opportunity whether they fill it or not for, for as long as they're here they're getting paid commissions every single time so, so how do they how do they recommend a company for business development to you they're profiling the the, the client they're, they're profiling the prospect at that company that, that the growth that. is that the, that we were talking about before if it's growing or or, or... yeah so that so again so let, let's let's picture Michael Michael G Cox okay he's working at ABC company I see Michael G Cox he's profiled we want to know who Michael if Michael has a let's say he's an individual contributor who is Michael G Cox reporting to right so then this the sorcerer is profiling that person and then also understanding the technology stack. Okay, so he's a data engineer. Okay, so they're working with Databricks, Spark. They're working with AWS, Playphone. So now, now we, and that's typically from a client search that we have. So all those candidates we're building for that particular client are now we're taking those same candidates that we're talking to, and then we're just introducing them to the prospective client with, from Michael G. Cox's uh, manager. So then that's where we're, we're presenting, uh, you know, it could be 5,000 hiring managers that, are, that our candidates are getting introduced to. That's how we're creating new business opportunity. Okay, uh, uh, we're getting, uh, uh, okay, we're actually one, at the hour point. Is yeah, there one, anything yeah. else? Uh, T. Brad, you've been so generous with this information. I am blown away. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suck up to the, to the guest today. I, I, I think it was great. All the stuff he told us. I didn't, we yeah. didn't get into who fun. makes the business fun. development call, but maybe another time you'll come back and tell us. Ernie, what, what did you want to say? No, I was just gonna say it was fun. He was good and a lot of great information from Brad. That was good. Okay. Thumbs Thanks. up. Everybody, thumbs up. Do you want to get anybody want to give it up? Okay. What's your domain name, T Brad? 
You can go to itprosphilly.com. I-T-P-R-O-S. Why does it still say Philly since you, you know, you went, someone, you know. Yeah, someone said that. We do have another domain called hireitpros.com. Uh, to be honest, I just don't have the time to to, to rework it. I don't, I don't think really anyone cares. Some people will say it, but at the end of the day, as long as we're delivering, no one cares what the domain name is. Uh, hireitpros.com is pretty good. Okay. Hireitpros.com, food industry recruiter, Uni Marino, Mario the Recruiter.com. David M. Marr, who's now a webinar leader, and the sales recruiter.com. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.